Welcome to worship at St. John's. It's great to be together as God's people as we do celebrate what Pentecost is all about. We again are in the season of Pentecost, that season of the Holy Spirit, which is the longest season of the church here. And it makes sense because Christ has risen, he has ascended, he has kept his promise to send his spirit, the great comforter and cop counselor to live among us, dwell among us, and lead us as his people. And so we focus again today on what that is all about as we continue our sermon series. Now, just some reminders, because as we end the month of June, we will now transition into uh, some more further plans on how we're returning to normal. Uh, for one, there will be no more Wednesday pre-recording services. So this, uh, this past Wednesday was the last one that we held. Uh, so now we'll be pre-recording or recording our Saturday evening services because we will return now to our three worship schedule. Um, so our worship services will be on Saturday at 5 o'clock and Sundays at 8.15 and 10.30. Uh, again, also, there's no more sign-up online. You don't need to sign up. We still will give you some guidance uh, as we've done this week. We have uh, just some markings on the pews to encourage you to sit in those pews to help with that social distancing. We encourage you to continue to wear the, the masks as well. I um, also want to remind you to, uh, to consider attending our budget Q&A forum, forum, which will be held on Sunday, June 12th, between the services. It'll be in the gym. We are going to spread those chairs out. Uh, but bring your questions. You should have received a mailing uh, giving you information about that. Uh, also, next weekend, the first weekend of July, we will be offering communion at all three services, but it'll be at the end of the services. So the way we'll do it is we'll conclude with the blessing, and anybody who would like to leave at that point may leave, uh, but then we'll continue with the service of the sacrament. It'll be a very short form so that when you receive the Lord's Supper as you proceed, you may actually just leave the sanctuary after receiving the body and blood of Christ. And then don't forget about all those online resources that we continue to offer between daily devotions, Bible studies, and opportunities to give. Uh, check out our website and see what's going on there. At this uh, point, we will rise and stand, and we will continue now with our opening hymn, How Great Thou Art.
begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends of Jesus, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, our words, and our actions, just as we have sinned by failing and refusing to use the talents that you have entrusted to us. Our love for ourselves is often more important to us than our love for you and those around us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now with our song of praise, Beautiful Savior. The epistle lesson for today 
comes from the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning at the first verse. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to the Lord. Jesus said, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed, and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, grace, peace, and a special measure of joy to all of you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, as we once again focus on that passage from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, as we've done in the last two weeks, and, and now this week and next week as well, my hope is at least by now you have that passage somewhat memorized. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It really is a great passage, and it's a passage that serves as a great reminder to us that as members of the body of Christ, chosen by Christ, we have all been uniquely gifted in fashion, designed by God to be a vital working part of His body, the church. And while this passage will certainly continue to remain the focal point again tonight and today and in the week ahead, 
we are also going to focus on the parable that we just heard from in Matthew's Gospel. Did you hear that parable that Jesus told? So that's where we're going to start to begin things this morning. In fact, I'm going to start by rereading the first section of that parable from Matthew 25, verses 14 through 18, where Jesus says, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug into the ground and hid his master's money. Now, when it comes to this particular section of scripture, I don't think it will come as a surprise to any of you that this is often the choice for stewardship sermons especially on those Sundays that we often title Pledge Sunday or Commitment Sunday, where worshipers, uh, members of the congregation have an opportunity to, to write down and offer their commitments and pledges to the Lord. And it makes sense, it makes sense, because it's a rather fitting and perfect reminder that we are to use what God has given us to honor and please Him first, to be good stewards of all that He has given, because, well, everything, Everything we have comes from Him. But what I admittedly find unfortunate is that when we have those Pledge or Commitment Sundays, because of those Sundays are often the primary choice for using this part of Jesus' message, we can easily lose sight that this parable is not just about money. Now don't misunderstand, there's no doubt before talent meant skill, it meant money. That's what it meant in this passage. And a talent, by the way, was an enormous amount of money, worth between 6,000 and 10,000 denarii, where one denarius equaled about one day's pay. So figure this out. To be given five talents, or 30,000 to 50,000 denarii, was a gift of unimaginable proportions, one that equaled more than most would ever come close to making in their lives. And of course, I think it's also easy to understand that with Jesus' use of money as the object lesson in this, in this story, most people would think that this parable has to be about money. And the answer is yes and no. You see, while there's no denying that this parable is certainly about the gifts given by God, including the monetary gifts that somehow we often convince ourselves that we have earned by way of our own effort, it's not just about money. In fact, I want you to take again, a look again at those five verses that we just read, verses 14 through 18, because I want you to take note of something that often gets missed, the qualifications, or lack thereof, of those who are receiving those gifts from their master. I mean, first of all, nowhere is it mentioned in this story that Jesus tells that any of these servants deserve any of what they received. You don't hear whether or not they were some kind of financial geniuses or maybe when they were young, some child prodigies or anything else to suggest that they deserve to be trusted with such highly valuable gifts. All we hear is that they were servants, just like you and like me. And yet the master still entrusts them with more than anyone else ever would. Secondly, I want you to note that they are not given the same amount of talents. Usually people pick up on that one right away. One servant is given five talents, another is given two, and then the third servant is only given one. Well, by the way, remembering that one talent alone was more than what most people would make in a long, long time. But each is given a different amount of talents, and yet they are, though they are not equal amounts, those talents are equally, equally important. And I don't want you to miss that point, because each servant has received an immeasurable abundance. Each is given according to their ability. Now, does the master give them more than they can handle? Not the way this parable is told. The master appears to know his servants well enough, and he knows what they're able to do, just as our Heavenly Father knows us and the abilities that he's already given us, created us with. You see, as has been mentioned so many times in the past couple of weeks, and even now this week and next week, as we look at the passage from Ephesians 2.10, 
Our Heavenly Father has certainly created us with purpose and plan. He has designed us specifically for His purposes, and every one of His children is created with gifts that have been given specifically to them to use to point others to Him. That's why even when we somehow forget how wonderfully and uniquely we have been fashioned and made, we can find ourselves once again returning to praise God as the psalmist did. I praise you, Lord, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's from Psalm 139. So, have you been specially designed? You better believe it. Endowed with gifts that are unique to you and also to be used to glorify and point to Jesus. And whether your talents are equivalent to the one talent that Jesus speaks of or to the many talents, they were entrusted to you by our Heavenly Creator in order to be used, not hidden. That's why the third point to be seen today in these opening verses of this parable is very important for every chosen and redeemed Christ follower. It's so important to hear this third point. You see, as we discover in this parable, the first servant, he puts his money to work. Now, here's the thing. Did he study the stock markets? Did he first go to college in order to make sure he was well prepared to handle this money in the most effective manner possibly? Uh, not hardly. He immediately begins putting those talents to work, though. He wastes absolutely no time. He wastes no talents. He uses what he's been given not to please himself, but rather to please his master. And the second servant does the same thing. Even though he hasn't been given the same amount of talents as the first servant, and it'd be so easy for him to get distracted by that, no. Does he appear to, to let that get in the way? No, one thing he appears to have in common is this. He too wastes no time in putting those talents to use. And he doesn't seem to be afraid to use what he's been given. In fact, he and the first servant might appear to be a little bit of a risk taker, if you will. I realize that we have the comfort of reading this parable some 2,000 years after Jesus first told it. And we also have the privilege to see in hindsight that these two servants are doing what they were supposed to do. But you have to admit that what they did, it was risky. I mean, what if their investments completely backfired? What if they appeared to have carelessly lost some or all of what they have been given? There are so many what ifs that we could come up with to explain the actions of the first two servants because nowhere in this parable do we find that they ever stopped to go through some sort of a lengthy process of contemplation before they took any steps to use their talents. In fact, it does make me want to ask, do these guys, these first two servants, do they have no fear at all? Don't they realize what the master might do to them if they failed or if they lost everything? Of course, maybe that's the point. Maybe that's a point that we often miss when we read this parable. Just maybe the first two servants did know their master. Maybe they were able to see what the third servant, for some reason, could not see. Maybe they didn't see their master as one who was waiting for some sort of reason to punish them. Maybe they saw and knew him as a gracious master who was willing to give them what no one else ever would. Maybe they saw in their master that he wasn't worried one bit about them possibly losing the talents that they had been given. Whatever it is, nowhere do we hear in this parable that these two men considered their master someone who was looking to, to punish them for failure or for taking a risk, all in order to please him. And nowhere do we hear that the first two servants saw him in the same way that the third servant saw him. Which leads me to ask, what about you? Do you know your master, your heavenly father? Have you seen who it is that has uniquely created and designed you, giving you talents, gifts? Do you look at your heavenly father as a loving father? Or do you see him as someone who is just waiting to hold everything against you? 
I think these are important questions to address in our walk of faith because how we see our Heavenly Father often has to do with how we then go and live out the gifts that He has given us. Because if you see our Heavenly Father apart from Jesus Christ, our Savior, then you cannot possibly know who our Heavenly Father is. You see, while there's no doubt that apart from Jesus, we would have every reason to fear God and His wrath in the same way that that third servant feared his master, with Jesus, our story is completely different, becomes brand new. In fact, our relationship with the Heavenly Father is brand new. And we get to see this in a man like Martin Luther. There was a time in the life of young Martin Luther when he looked at God in a similar fashion to the way the third servant looked at his master. Early on in his life, Martin Luther feared the wrath of his Heavenly Father, and therefore he was hesitant to take the right kind of risk. But now when Luther met Jesus, when God revealed himself to Luther in the person of Christ, Jesus rid Luther of that old desire to simply hide or keep everything from falling apart. When Luther met his true Heavenly Father, his true Master, everything changed. Because what Luther discovered is what those first two men in this parable appeared to already know about their Master. If you knew what they knew about him, there was never any reason to fear punishment at all. There was no reason to go and, and hide or dig a hole. There was no reason to run, no reason to bury that massive and unique treasure that they had been freely given despite their lack of qualifications. They were risk takers in all the right ways. And yes, they dared to do something the third servant would not nor could not do. They dared to fail. They did. They dared to fail. And what kind of response did they receive from their master when they returned? Well, take a look at verses 21 and 23. What does he say to them? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. I mean, can you imagine hearing those words from our Heavenly Father? I've often thought to myself what I'd like to have written on my tombstone, and the bottom line is I really don't care. You just want to put my name, that's good enough. But something like, well done, good and faithful servant would be good. That would be good, but you know what? Honestly, I really don't care what's written there because what I want to do is I want to hear those words from God. Don't you? I want to hear those words from our Heavenly Father. When I enter into eternal paradise, that place that's been guaranteed by the one who has forgiven you and me for all those times when we failed to use the talents, the gifts that we've been given, I still want to hear from Him, well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what? I want you to hear those words too. I want you to hear God call you good. Believe me, I know I nor any of us deserve to hear those words, but we can all look forward to it because we have been, we have been covered by the Master's precious Son, Jesus Christ, the one who is truly good. So what a moment that will be. And I say will be because it's a part of the greatest gift and promise given to you and me through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What a moment that will be because God has revealed an overabundance of grace, mercy, and forgiveness through Jesus for all those times when we fail to use what we've been given. And what a moment that will be to be called good and faithful by the only one who can make men and women and children like you and me truly good in his eyes. You see, here's the thing. When Jesus calls us good and faithful servants, that counts. That matters. In fact, as author Max Lucado once put it, only Jesus can make bad sinners good. And only Jesus makes the frail faithful. Well done, good and faithful. Not well done flashy or well done good and famous. Not even good and fruitful. Just well done, good and faithful. This, by the way, was the misunderstanding of the third servant. He didn't know his master. He could not see the love and the care of his master. He could not see that he had been entrusted with gifts that were given freely and designed especially for him from a caring and a trusting master. In fact, when we read this about, we read about his reasoning as to why he chose what he did, I find this third servant's defense case 
rather interesting. You see, in verse 24, the servant refers to his master as a hard man. And yet nowhere else in the parable will you find this said by the other two servants. The other two servants, they don't use words to describe their master this way at all. And yet when repeating the third servant's accusations, even the master himself refrains from truly referring to himself as a hard man. Only the third servant used these words to describe his master because, as author Max Cato once put it, his sin wasn't mismanagement. His sin was not knowing who his master was. He did not know his master, even after living with him, being around him, working in his house for who knows how long. But friends of Jesus, we do. We know who our master is. Not by human reason or through something that we may be read other than God's word. We know our master because he has revealed himself to us. We have seen him in Jesus Christ. And we have seen that though he is truly the judge and will rule for all eternity, his love, his love has been lavished upon us. And through his blood we have been claimed and made righteous and holy and good in his sight. And because of Jesus, we also know this. We have nothing to fear. We now have nothing to fear when it comes to using the unique talents and gifts that have been designed and given to each and every one of us. So as we look at the gifts that God has given to you and to me, as we look for that heavenly sweet spot, your story, my story, may we never ever forget who our master truly is and what he has done for us so that we can boldly set out to use the gifts he's given us immediately, all to magnify and glorify his name. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. At this time, we continue now with the hymn of the day. We rise and sing together, let us ever walk with Jesus.
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Since we've already had an opportunity to offer our offerings through um, the plates that were available when we came through the carport entrance, or if you're at home uh, online, we'll continue now with our prayers. Now, we were set to recognize Janice Corstan, she's a part of this recording, the servants, uh, but she had a birthday party, a really important birthday party with one of her grandchildren, so there was no way we could hold her back from that one. She's retired, folks, she gets to do this stuff. Um, but we will be recognizing her uh, over the weekend, and I would remind you again the opportunity to join us for the luncheon on Sunday afternoon from 12.30 to 4 at Pottawatomie Park. We ask that you sign up ahead of time online for that. But we do give thanks to God for Janice. She has been a great blessing in so many ways as she demonstrates the gifts that God had given her and has given her and continues to find ways to use those talents that he's entrusted her with. So we wish her God's blessings. We continue now with the prayers of the church. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that through your Holy Spirit you have called us to repentance and opened our hearts to receive the forgiveness and grace that you give. Lord, move us as your people to now live out the vocations into which we've been placed, that we might use the talents you have entrusted to all of us. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, as people who are appointed daily to our Savior Jesus, open our hearts to your call to proclaim and live out your gospel message in our community and throughout the world, in a society and culture that continues to reflect the turmoil and the brokenness of our sinful lives. Lead us to live lives that exemplify Christ while we demonstrate the kind of reconciliation that we're called to live as God's people. Fill us with courage by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may be bold in our witness. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, keep your church faithful to its task to reach out in your name and with the gospel of salvation. Bless the members of this congregation as well as all our Christian brothers and sisters in our community. Keep all of us faithful to our task, that together we might be faithful to our mission as your people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, according to your good and gracious will, provide for all who are in need of healing. Watch over them and grant wisdom and guidance to all who minister to their needs, that their work may bring healing to those who are ill including those we have named before you this past week, as well as those we now name in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, Holy Spirit, you continue to lead your church as you have in the past, and you have always held true to your promise to be with us always. Give us clear guidance that we may see the task you have placed before us for the purpose of sharing your love and mercy. And in all these things, Lord, grow our faith that we may continue to seek out your will in each of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We continue now with our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art.